Okay. All right, it looks like we are live to Facebook. So thank you so much, anyone who's joining us on Facebook. My name is Clara. I am the Public Education Event Coordinator at NAMI NYC, the National Alliance for Mental Illness of New York City. This event is co-hosted by NAMI NYC and United We Stand of New York. So thank you so much, everyone who's joining us on Zoom and everyone who's joining us on Facebook. If you're joining us on Zoom, again, please feel free to ask questions and make comments in the chat. Introduce yourself. Tell us where you're calling in from. We've got some folks from California, some, some folks from New York visiting Nurse Services. You're a great organization. Um, we are really happy to have you. Um, we've got some other folks from New York, from St. Louis. So thanks so much for joining us. Um, if you are on Facebook, please do feel free to make comments on the stream. Uh, we do have somebody watching those and any questions that you have will be forwarded to us. We'll be taking questions at the end of the presentation. Amanda will be answering uh, as many of your questions as we can, but uh, you can also ask questions in the chat and if there's um, things that we can answer, uh, I um, will be happy to help out with that. Uh, so I'm going to very quickly introduce NAMI NYC and say a little bit about us, and then I'm going to turn it over to Amanda Hott, who will be our presenter this afternoon. NAMI NYC is a grassroots mental health organization. We uh, are working remotely at the moment, um, so we are serving many places even beyond the five boroughs of New York City, but that's where we're based. We're based in Manhattan. We offer support, education, and advocacy for all individuals and families impacted by mental illness. That means that we, during this time, are providing remote support groups, remote classes, and a lot of other different services for anybody who's either dealing with a mental health issue um, themselves or uh, is supporting a family member, whether that's a child, as, as many of you may be, uh, or an adult, whether that's their own child, whether it's a sibling, whether it's a parent or a friend or a spouse. Um, we know that it can be really challenging to support somebody who's struggling and we want to give people a space and a community to learn from each other, to share their experiences and get support uh, so that they can better support their loved ones. Um, all of our services are free of charge um, and you can find out more by going to our website at naminyc.org. You can also find out our calendar of events by going to naminyc.org slash calendar. Um, and you can also call our helpline and I'm gonna put all of this in the chat as well as soon as I'm done talking, but you can also call our helpline Monday through Friday, uh, 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. That number is 212-684. 3264. You can also email us at helpline at naminyc.org. So if you want to find out more about what we can offer you, please feel free to do that as well. This presentation is being recorded, so the recording will be available on our Facebook videos page at NAMI NYC, the NAMI NYC Facebook page. So if you want to go back and watch it over again after you're done, um, or if you want to share it with a friend, you should be able to do that. Um, and I do see a question about the slides. Um, so uh, if you are interested in the slides, we can provide those. Uh, you can email me, um, Clara, at C-K-I-E-L-Y at NAMINYC.org after the presentation in order to request them. Uh, I believe Amanda is going to be providing her contact information as well. So you can follow up with either of us if you have any questions or would like to request the slides. So with that, uh, I am going to go ahead and turn it over to Amanda Hott, um, who is going to be our uh, our pre presenter uh, this afternoon. Thank you so much. Thank you, Clara. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. My name is Amanda Hort, and um, I work for United We Stand of New York. We are a community-based parent resource center um, that services families, children, youth, and young adults with disabilities in the boroughs of Brooklyn, Queens, and South Bronx. What we do is we provide workshops, trainings, as well as one-to-one -one support 
which does include um, advocacy. And today, what I'm going to basically be talking to you all about are um, if a child presents with challenging behaviors, what can the school do in order to support you? I know that during these times, uh, remote learning for many um, has presented another challenge. And so hopefully through this, we can figure out um, what, how can we utilize this information so that the schools can help um, anyone better prepare for supporting a, a youth or a young one with um, some challenging behaviors. I also want to just keep in mind uh, that a lot of the information that I'm going to be sharing or the majority of the information that I'm going to be sharing today is New York um, centric or focus. However, I will be referencing federal law, which is through, you know, it, it can work throughout all the 50 states. However, the the way that it presents itself would kind of be, it would be different per state, okay? So just keep that in mind. So, um, okay. So uh, here's my information. It's, uh, you can reach me. This is my direct phone number, 718-302-4314. You can also text that number. Um, and then my email address is a h a u g h t at u w s o f n y dot org. You can also find information on our website www.uwsofny.org. Um, and just briefly before I start the the powerpoints, I just want to give you all a heads up. Uh, our office, our physical office is closed. Um, so I'm working from home and right now I have a one-year-old daughter who's currently sleeping. So if you see me like jerk my head a lot, it's because I'm hearing noises from the other room and I'm, you know, currently I'm the only one home. So I have to be, you know, pay, pay attention to that. Okay, so let me, oh wait, I'm trying to minimize the view button from the pit. Um, the, the screen uh, looks fine from our end, uh, Amanda, you can see the full. Okay, because on my end, the, you know, the pictures, uh, the, the um, you know, with everybody, it's blocking some of the, the wording oh. for me. So I can't, I can't read sure. it. Do you, do you mind? Uh, it it's good. Uh, sure, I can read it. So in my world, there are no bad kids just impressionable, conflicted young people wrestling with emotions and impulses, trying to communicate their feelings and needs the only way they know how. I love this quote. I found this quote on Google who um, has become my best friend throughout the years. Um, and a lot of the times when I, when I advocate for families that do have children who present with um, challenging behaviors, Oftentimes, in, in my perspective, the, the thought process is bad, you know, the behavior is bad. Um, and I always look at it and, and say, no, the, behavior, the child is not bad, the behavior is bad. What is it that is lacking um, in order to support the child or the individual so that these behaviors can go away? So that's my my point of view, and I kind of want to get, you know, when you when you heard this or when you read this quote, your first impression on it. If you, you know, type it into the chat, Clara, if you can read a couple. I see. Uh, behavior reflects need. It's a great summary. Behavior is communication. Yep. 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 There's always different ways to to. Uh, express oneself. Okay, so down to the nitty gritty. Um, so in order to understand what services can be provided or what kind of supports should be talked about, um, we need to understand the need for a behavior intervention plan. So um, I got this from, 
I believe, Webster's Dictionary, and it defines behaviors as, one, the way in which someone conducts oneself or behaves, two, the manner of conducting, see, um, conduct, entry, one, sense, two, um, oneself, criminal behavior, and normal, uh, and normal adolescent behavior, and B, anything that an organism does involving action in response to stimulation. And so when we're looking at it in, in a child's point of view or in a young um, adult's point of view, it's, um, it defines a stimulus or situ situation. So an example would be, Mary cried when she fell off of her bike. So she fell and then she cried. And so that's the, the, stimulate, that's the stimulus to what happened. All right. So when thinking about that, right, behaviors and how it, it manifests itself, one of the main things that I try to figure out is what does, for us, New York State say about behaviors and how does it translate into schools? Um, they're in New York State and in New York City specific, there's zero tolerance, right, um, for behaviors. I don't know how that looks like in California, or I believe it was St. Louis. Um, but for New York State, there was a, there's a zero tolerance policy. And so how does an individual who has behaviors, how are they being supported? So this is a part of the New York State regulations in terms of um, supporting students with disabilities. So functional behavior assessment is given when there are concerns about a student and what, is, and what is going on with their behaviors and it impeding their ability to learn within the classroom. So it is the means to process, uh, I'm sorry, mean the process of determining why a student engages in behaviors that impede learning and how the student's behavior relates to the environment. The functional behavior assessment shall be developed consistent with the requirements of section 200 Point twenty two a of this part and shall include, but is not limited to, the identification of the problem behavior, the definition of the behavior in concrete terms, the identification of the cont contextual, excuse me, factors that contribute to the behavior, including cognitive and affective factors, and the formulation of the hypothesis regarding the general condition under which a behavior usually occurs and probably consequences that um, serve to maintain it. So basically the functional behavior assessment tests what type of behavior, like um, observes the type of behavior and, and all the factors around it. What happens when the child is, is uh, engaging in this behavior um, and, and um, when does it usually happen? When does the behavior usually happen? Once the functional behavior assessment is conducted, then there's the behavior intervention plan, which I, I'm, I, you know, I can read this, but the behavior intervention plan takes all of the information from the functional behavior assessment and develops an alternative um, way to address the unwanted behavior or the negative behavior. So, a part of the federal law, as well as uh, New, York, New York State regulations, um, an FBA should be considered for any student, because this can be done for students that have disabilities and students that do not have the disability. Um, but when considering an FBA, we want to look at does the behavior impede the child's ability to learn or the young one's ability to learn? So another way to look at that is, is the teacher constantly redirecting or now whomever is doing the remote, if, you're, if your student is remote, are you having to constantly redirect? What's going on? What do those behaviors look like? For in-person learning, the other thing is elopement. Is the is the student running out of the classroom? Flight, you know, just um, not staying where they need to be. If the student is injuring themselves or others, if it is an avoidance of school, if there's an avoidance of school, we want to look at that. And also, um, in terms of 
special education services when teachers or when the IEP team, the individual edu uh, education plan team get together to consider a more restrictive setting. Any questions so far? I'm actually gonna, um, I think we've, uh, I'm gonna allow people to unmute themselves um, okay. just so that in case uh, anybody's having trouble with the chat, um, we can, uh, well, I guess we can, we can allow that. Uh, but please do if you have questions um, or uh, anything's come, come up that's confusing, please feel free to put, um, put it in the chat. Okay, cool. All right. All right. So breaking down the functional behavior assessment. So if there is a um, if there is a need to look at a behavior intervention plan or to look at a way to support students who have unwanted behaviors, the functional behavior um, assessment goes over certain things. So they, when doing the functional behavior assessment, they want to look at the frequency. So how long, and how, I'm, I'm sorry, how often does the behavior happen? How long does it happen? How severe is the behavior? And how long does it take for the behavior to start after a verbal command or event? When doing the functional behavior assessment, while thinking about those and trying to answer those questions, you know, with the functional behavior assessment, there must be multiple sources in order to collect the data on the behavior. So that would include direct observation from school psychologists, from teachers, um, multiple parties. You as a parent or caregiver should be involved. There should be conversation, questions. The student um, would be asked questions as well. Any related service providers or anyone basically who has um, connection with the student during the school day, as well as previous records. Okay, so when it so also it must be done by a team of professionals. So the school psychologist, um, um, social worker. If your child goes outside for um, any type of behavior therapy you can definitely ask them to share the information with the school so that the functional behavior assessment is um, very thorough. All right, so once the functional behavior assessment is conducted, there is a meeting about behavior intervention plans. So when the request for a functional behavior intervention happens, it is supported through IDEA, which is the Individuals with um, Disabilities Education Act. That is a federal law. When I spoke to you all about um, whether or not the behavior is impeding or hindering the child or the student um, in the classroom, there is a specific guideline within the federal law called FAPE, which stands for Free Appropriate Public Education. So with the Free Appropriate Public Education, if the child's ability to learn is mitigated by their behaviors, then if there's no supports that are given to try and get that those behaviors away or to fix those behaviors, then FAPE is not being provided. The free appropriate public education is not being provided. The other part of the law is LRE, which stands for least restrictive environment. As far as um, when I had talked about considering more restrictive, there is a continuum of services for students with disabilities. And what the school, what the team, what you, the family, should start to work on is least restrictive services first. So general educate, an idea would be general education with um, related services. So the related services can be occupational therapy, um, counseling, you know, things like that, resource room or sets, 
and then you work your way up from you know from the the services that that are provided through the law all right so when we're thinking about whether or not this child would be uh, would benefit from a behavior intervention plan we need to consider um, what those behavior, what positive behavior interventions are, and how is it going to address that behavior, that specific behavior? So, um, so what does the plan cover? So the plan covers skills and trainings to in increase the appropriate behaviors, strategies, and there's always a review. Now, keep in mind that the behavior intervention plan is not a part of the student's um, individual education plan or IEP, but it is attached to it. So it becomes binding. Whatever strategies are there, however it is that you all come up with a plan, that becomes binding for a student with a disability. For a student without a disability, it is based, the behavior intervention plan is basically a behavior intervention plan. Any questions on that? Excuse me, sorry. Can you comment on what the impact of it being binding or non-binding is please? Sure. So binding, um, okay, so if you, if your student has an IEP, then what it means is that there's a law that binds that IEP that um, the, the school needs to follow. The services that are on that plan, the individual education plan, is broken down to have, so that that student is allowed to receive or basically to kind of, um, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> um, it's, it's supported by law. So whatever is written down on the child's um, individualized education plan um, is supported by law, is backed by law. So it's mandated. It's a requirement that needs to happen on the school's end as well as the family's end. Um, it not being binded basically means that we can try this out. Right? You can also get it at risk. There are services that schools have um, called PBIS, which stands for Positive Behavior, Interve um, Positive Behavior Intervention Services, and that's school-wide, but you can definitely make it so that it's more specific to the individual. There's also what's called RTI, which is response to intervention that also supports the behavior. So those are what supports um, a student who may be at risk for receiving special education services or just needs a little bit more support in just the, the focus of behaviors. Uh, one more question, Amanda. Uh, I know we said we would do questions at the end and we will do more at the end, but uh, just one more quickly on this topic. Uh, if a child has an e e IEP but is now experiencing mental health problems that are impacting behavior in school, would it be appropriate to request uh, a functional behavioral assessment for a possible behavioral intervention plan to be added to the IEP? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I, I my say is if you feel like it may it's something that has not been looked into then definitely request one and see where it goes from there um especially if again when um i don't know if i said this before but when students get services through um the individual with edu uh, with disability education act it is because there is a, a something is impeding or blocking their ability to learn alongside their peers who do not have any disabilities. And that includes behavior. So if whatever is happening with your student, with your child is really affecting them, I would take it, I would speak to the school. I would write a letter. I always tell my, my families, write a letter Email is key now because everything is remote. So you have a timestamp because as with everything, when you request to be um, an, an assessment, there is a time frame that goes along with the assessment. Okay. But I would definitely look into it. Okay. 
So, um, so behavior intervention plans should do the following. It should prevent the unwanted behaviors. It should be, in, it should be an instruction, right? And it should provide responses to the behaviors that you want to see. And then there should be a portion where it is being monitored. Are we seeing less of that behavior? If not, then we may need to go back and change it to, so that we can start to see less of the behavior. Oh, I thought there was another slide to that. Um, okay. So when thinking about the stuff that I said, now we're gonna try and figure out how that all comes together in creating a behavior intervention plan. Okay. So when we create a behavior intervention plans, there's an ABC of behaviors. So what does that mean? So A, antecedent, what are the triggers? This is what you'll find. Um, you should find this through the functional behavior assessment through that direct observation, through um, you know, documentation and data that have been collected, through having conversations with the student if possible, as well as the family member. Um, so what is the trigger? The behaviors, it could be one or it could be multiple behaviors, right? So what are they? Let's identify them. And then see the consequences. So as I have stated before, what happens as a result? All right. So, um, so an example would be antecedent. Mr. Smith is explaining to the class about the United States Constitution, the behavior. Mary inter interrupts Mr. Smith a few times, the consequence. Mr. Smith tells Mary to leave his classroom. So we want to know what is happening, right? So we want to find out what is the function of the behavior. The first thing that we want to do is rule out any type of medical. Oh, sorry about that, guys. It's hard because my um, mouse isn't showing up. <laughs> Um, the other thing we want to know is whether or not the behavior is as a result of escaping something, right? So um, I'll give you an example. When I don't want to do the dishes, I tell my boyfriend, um, I'm not feeling well, I'm going to go lay down. I'm escaping having the responsibility of it's my turn to do the dishes and I just don't want to. Attention or tangible, something that they want, something that they need, something that they need to grasp onto. As well, oh, um, sensory is that, I'm sorry, tangible. Yeah, tangible can be the same thing. Let me just, all right. So the reason why I put understanding your child's disability here is because a lot of the times when behaviors occur um, from the work that I've done, these are the, the um, these are, are kind of the, the disabilities that, that come up often enough. So ADHD, attention deficit hyperactive disorder, ADHD or ODD, so attention deficit hyperactive disorder or oppositional defiant disorder, autism or emotional disability. And so with these, these ones specific, I mean, you can have a learning disability and, and also require a behavior intervention plan. But these, excuse me, these are um, basically what comes, you know, what comes to mind when I was developing this, because a lot of the times when, when, and this could be not true to you, but for me, a lot of the times when I've had to create or help a family and support a family in terms of getting a behavior intervention plan, it was 
because their child had an underlining uh, diagnosis of ADHD. Um, there was a diagnosis of autism where speech was very minimal. And so the behaviors were so, so much so that it really impeded that young one's um, ability to focus in the classroom, learn in the classroom and, and talk and speak their needs. And as a result, behavior started to come up. So understanding your child's disability and how it can definitely affect the way that they learn in the classroom or affect the way that they're learning remotely, because as you know, things change when you're at home, right? Um, helps to figure out how to develop the behavior intervention plan specific to your child. So some of the supports that can be given and that can be written in um, to the behavior intervention plan are check-ins, breaks, options. Sometimes when you have, when a student has too much going on, they have to do this, they have to do that, they have to do this. It, it's, it's just too much, it's overwhelming, they're not doing anything. And so providing at least one or two options, depending on the age, depending on the cognitive ability, helps mitigate some behaviors providing reminders that can be visual reminders. It could be, you know, just speaking reminders, having a routine. Um, you can break that down as specific as need be in the behavior intervention plan. The other supports that can be given are counseling. Counseling can help so that there is, that provides an additional check-in somebody that the student trusts, somebody that they can really go to and kind of say, hey, you know, I'm feeling this type of way. Um, parent counseling and training, that's something that can support that collaboration between the school and between, you know, the school and home. What can we do together? If the behaviors are so much so, then there is an option for a power professional, which is a, an individual who would work closely with that one um, student or two students, depending on the need. So I have um, a bigger picture of this, but I just wanted to show you that the um, New York City's behavior intervention plan, it's several pages, but it basically, you know, it basically breaks down what um, I spoke to you all about. And I'll show that in a minute. So, um, and again, you all are going to be getting these slides. Um, I will be sending that um, the the behavior intervention, the sample behavior intervention plan to Clara so that she can send it to whomever uh, would like to have it. But here are the resources that I that I kind of went to, um, and the questions while I pull up the behavior intervention thing. There was a question uh, a minute ago um, in the chat. Uh, can you talk about whether private, private schools or specialty admission schools are responsible for doing um, FBAs or BIPs? So, so FBAs and BIPs are a federal, um, it's, it's a regulation federal mandate. So if there are behaviors, the way that they come around, come about and develop a plan is completely up to them. As a parent, if, especially if your student is a student who receives special education services, this is a right to you and your child. And so it is a matter of figuring out how the, the plan is going to happen. Um, oftentimes, they they have a plan. Like for instance, charter schools in New York City, um, they create their own plan, and then what happens is that the committee on special education comes in and does this plan here. But so there's a like a side by side. So again, it is up to the um, the school, the type of school on how they're going to provide this service. But they are still required to provide it. Yes. Yeah. And uh, so uh, there was a question about um, sharing the presentation and the sample 
a behavioral intervention plan through email. And yes, we will send the slides and the sample plan out. Um, yeah, I'm gonna, sh I'm gonna, um, I definitely gonna send this. I want you to keep them like this is legit. The way New York City has the behavior intervention plan. I actually, this was one of um, my clients, and I just deleted all his information and left what the um, <laughs> and left what is supposed to be on there. And so, what you'll see is if you go to the New York State uh, Department of Education website and and put in the search bar because that website is horrible for me but if you put in the search bar like functional behavior assessment what you'll see is they'll have like that breakdown and it basically this is basically cut and paste from what the regulations are asking for um one of the things that i did want to say is the so this is going to be filled out so this is a lot of words right and a lot of the times when I have families, you know, it's frustrating because, you know, they type everything in and then it kind of looks just all the same. So it's hard to pick out um, what you need to really look at. So I'm happy that I'm able to provide this to you all with not, nothing extra. So what I wanted to focus on real quick is setting an event. When... It, we want to know, or you want to know what is going on, the settings, there, there can be accommodations, there can be, um, if it, let's just say, I mean, we are remote right now, but if you think back about, you know, when behaviors occurred often, it could have been in math class or ELA or something like that. And so when you look at the settings of events, what can happen? What conversations can we have in order to say, look, the child got to go to ELA, but how can we get them there better? Is it possible that we have them transition maybe five minutes before the rest of the class so that by the time they get to the ELA classroom setting, um, those behaviors are mitigated? Does that make sense? Amanda, sorry. Yeah. Um, it looks like your screen share is frozen. Um, is it? Yeah. So I think... Uh, Potentially, if you could stop sharing and then start sharing again with the sample VIP pulled up. So okay. that's what you're looking at, right? Yeah. Okay. Hold tight, everybody. We will be. Okay. I'm going to share my screen again. Thanks everyone for your patience. You see it now? Uh, so now it's just, there's like a bar. Oh, really? Okay, I'm sorry about the that. The VIP sample. It does say VIP sample, but it's right. not, the whole screen isn't showing. All right, me. Let, me, let me try again. And if not, I mean, you all will get it um, via email as soon as possible. Oh, Can you see it? Yeah. That was okay. All right. So this needs to be broken down. This needs to be chunked, um, broken down for whatever behaviors. Um, the other thing that I want to say is that when you need to collect data on this, that's one of the things. When you have this behavior intervention plan, you want to collect data and not, um, you want to collect measurable data. And so there should be a form that teachers are filling out. I tried to get it, but I don't work for the Department of Education, so it wasn't allowing me to. I tried so many ways to get it. Um, but there is a specific form that teachers need to be filling out um, in order to start tracking that behavior. The, the second thing that I want to say is there are a lot of times that um, there are concerns with multiple behaviors. And one of the things that I tell families in order not to get overwhelmed is to look at the most severe behaviors, okay? So an example would be my, my child has ADHD and they get up or they start tapping on the table 
um, when they start to when they start to get riled up or when they've lost focus. And then from there, they get up and then they, they leave the classroom. And, and you know, the tapping on the table is annoying to the teacher. You always get, I'm always getting complaints about that. And the fact that my child is getting up and running out the classroom because they're bored, they're going for a drink of water. I don't really wanna focus so much on the tapping on the table. I need to focus on changing the behavior of when my child starts to get bored that they need to automatically get up without permission and walk out the classroom to get a cup of water. That is dangerous. And so I wanna focus my attention and the intervention plan on that. What can we do to support that? Um, also keep in mind the cognitive ability of the student as well as their age. There have been times where I've had meetings about five-year-olds, you know, parents are getting called, come pick up your kid. You know, they, they're not sitting down, they don't stay still, they're not doing circle time. And it's like, well, how old are they? You know, so sometimes that gets me riled up because it's like, all right, <laughs> we need to figure out a better form of communication and what's expected and what should be expected at this point. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen for right now and just kind of like have a conversation with you all. Any other questions? If you want to add anything, comments or what have you, I'm open for it. So one question that I think uh, is from the chat that I think is a great place to start potentially is um, who is responsible for absorbing the cost of the assessment and the follow-up support? Thank you. Um, so the Department of Education is responsible for absor absorbing the cost. Again, as I have mentioned, um, under um, the Individuals with Disability Education Act, that, that basic, that headline of faith, free appropriate public education, whatever services are provided to the student is at no cost to the family. I mean, you can definitely go outside to, to receive services, but then that would be coming from um, whatever insurance you all may have. Another question, also a great question. Um, what is the ideal age to begin this process? And uh, can you talk about the importance of early intervention? Um, begin the process of just regular like services or the behavior intervention type plan? Um, if the person who, uh, to begin the assessment. Um, so I, I um, a couple of years back, I had a foster daughter and we started the functional behavior assessment in pre-K. Um, oh, I think this is a question, this is a more general question that um, you maybe a little bit of a longer answer, but what strategies would you suggest during remote learning for, uh, actually the person who asked that question, can you elaborate the strategies for what? That might take that person a, a moment. Um, I do love, um, thank you, Debbie, uh, emphasizing the team working with a child should be able to come up with at least 10 strengths for any child. Really good point. Okay, so what strategies would you suggest during remote learning for a student in middle school that has an IEP? Um, I, would, I would suggest a routine, it depends. That's like general, but at the same time, specific to the needs and what that student, uh, what are the strengths I, I guess I would think about. What are the strengths that really draw that student to the remote? Um, what are the learnings? What are the learning styles of that student? And then figure out a way to support um, that student with the strengths that's going to support the the kind of weaknesses, if you will. Um, there are there is I found today. It's called pbisworld.com. They have a, um, a section there, it's, I, I, it's for teachers, but they do have a section for families and remote learning and kind of like developing a routine, 
something similar to what would happen if they were in brick and mortar. So it gives you a lot of different like charts. Um, they have one for just overall family chores and they break it down by age. Um, so that's P-B-I-S world, W-O-R-L-D.com. So they have a lot of free printouts for that. So you can definitely um, go through that website because I know that I've, I kind of tore it up <laughs> to see some stuff. So definitely go through that website and see what works for, your, for you and your child during this remote learning. Also speak to the teachers, figure out like, you know, when they're in school, what happens in school? How can it transition to a degree at home? Does that mean um, figuring out a dedicated space? Um, so if it's the kitchen table, then knowing that from this time to this time, there's no, there's absolutely no eating. We're going to focus on, on school because in school you don't have those snacks, right? What you do is you have a lunch period and so on and so forth. And then probably because you have the flexibility of being home, provide those breaks, which would also, you know, can also be done in a, in a behavior intervention plan, right? So you get a two minute break, let's set the timer, you know, things like that couple of specific questions. Um, one about, uh, in terms of the assessment, how long is the observation period generally? And then sort of the question that goes along with that, how often is the plan reviewed? So in turn, thank you. That's a really good question. Um, in terms of the assessment, the observation, um, I always say this policy and practice. The practice is, the observation happens at three separate times, right? Um, just to get an overall snapshot. So it could happen right when the student comes into school. It can happen at lunchtime and then it can happen towards the ending of the day. Um, so, it, and it can happen through multiple days. So those three observations, one can happen each, my daughter just woke up. <laughs> one can happen, um, each, you know, each day. Um, in terms of like remote, the way that things are happening remotely, I'm not, I think you would, I think that the flexibility there would be um, kind of gathering the information of what's going on more than an, um, an observation, having that conversation of what you all are seeing. Um. And, and yeah, how often would it be, would it be reviewed? Should the plan be reviewed? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, so the plan, the plan, so in New York, the plan is usually reviewed. Uh, you can set it, you have that conversation and you can set it. But typically what happens is that the plan is reviewed every six weeks, all right? Every six weeks. Um, Another question, uh, um, uh, taking as an example, a middle school aged child, um, could the functional behavioral assessment be for a specific class or is it preferable if you're considering a functional behavioral assessment to look at it, um, sort of to look at the whole picture? So the, you look at the whole picture first and because the, behave, the functional behavior assessment um, is trying is trying to really uh, zero in on the behaviors, uh, especially through the observation. It's going. It should uh, tell you that it's in this specific class. And so, mm -hmm. when developing the behavior intervention plan afterwards, the focus is really going to be around probably before that class and then after that class. You know, before, during, and after that class. What kind of supports are needed? What um, accommodations or modifications would be needed in order to mitigate the unwanted behavior. Uh, another question about remote learning. What do paraprofessional slash uh, ABA services look like during remote learning for early elementary school students? So depending, depend, that is a specific question that needs to be answered with the team. So if you have a functional behavior, um, I'm sorry, if you have a behavior intervention plan already, 
and there are guidelines as to what the paraprofessional um, is supposed to be doing, then the question really becomes, how is that going to turnkey while my child is remotely? How are they going to do that check-in? Are there, because if, it, if the behavior intervention plan needs to be changed in order to support remote learning, then the conversation needs to happen. You can always put in a request to say you'd like to review the behavior intervention plan um, to make those changes. Great. These are all fantastic questions. Uh, anyone, um, again, uh, folks do have the ability to unmute themselves at this point. So if you'd like to unmute yourself and ask a question, um, now is a great time to do that. Um, folks can also put, I think I've gone through all the questions that were in the chat, but if there are um, other ones or ones that I missed, please feel free to put them. So I, I okay, um, thank you for that. Uh, one of the things that I did want to say is that when, when thinking about um, behavior intervention plans and the need of it, a lot of the times, um, you know, the idea behind it is really to provide that student with success where they have felt like they're failing, right? And so when developing the behavior intervention plan, you really want to focus on how is this going to support the student and feeling more successful in the behavior, specifically mm -hmm. around like, a, a, um, you know, an example would be if my, my child has ADHD, they can't help it. And they tell me that all the time. And they come to me crying, mommy, I don't know why I did that, because it was impulsive, and they got blamed for it, right. So that kind of trying to develop a plan that is going to support that student and feeling like, hey, look, it happens, we're trying to work towards getting it better, giving you strategies and tools that you can use at any given moment. The idea of any service through special education is to provide the student with strategies and tools that they can always have. Special education service is a service and not a place. And so that, I, so that kind of thought process when it comes to behavior intervention plans should be the same. We want this for right now because it provides my child with a, 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 a leveling platform, but we don't want, you know, we don't want my child to have this throughout their entire schooling. We want to be able to get this done, correct it when needed, and move forward from there so that they can feel successful. Absolutely. So like, yeah, I think that that's like, um, those are my kind of like closing remarks. And, and the other thing, now that I think about it, is any institution that, that gets federal funding has to abide by the law. And, and again, um, functional behavior assessments as well as behavior intervention plans are supported through that federal law, Individuals with um, Disabilities Education Act, okay? Ah, okay. Uh, so one more question. Um, I do want to, I, I realized there was a question that I missed. Um, someone uh, who was speaking about um, a young adult stepson who is uh, very avoidant and not um, spending all of his time in his room and sort of how to address that. And I wanted to, Amanda, I don't know if you have any thoughts about sort of that specific situation. I did want to highlight um, NAMI NYC has a lot of services for um, parents uh, of both kids under 18 and older, you know, young adults um, uh, to, to better sort of support for, for parents to better um, support their kids. And I think um, for the person who asked that question, uh, the parents of children and young adults support group might be a great place um, for you to uh, speak with other parents who are, and step parents who may be sort of dealing with similar issues. Um, that's something that it sounds like is not so much um, an issue with school. So the the specific schools of the FDA and the VIP are maybe less appropriate, but there are resources out there, and I'll put some things in the chat as well. Yeah. Um, but there was also a question um, of. About uh, oh, can parents request an in-home functional behavioral assessment through their school? 
You can, but with everything that's going on specifically around, you know, again, I don't know what state you're, you're asking from, but uh, with New York City, uh, there has been a lot of flexibility and a lot of things have been, assessments and such have been um, happening remotely. And so at this point, it's more around requesting and saying that, that the need is there and putting that on paper, um, because at the end of the day, the evaluations are the same. So mm -hmm. the federal law doesn't have, uh, you know, um, doesn't have like a sub law under, if this is remote, then it's only remote, right? And so putting the request that you prefer it, that it's going to work for your child better, um, if it is in person, is your right. Uh, but keep in mind that there are there has been a lot of flexibility around districts and, and what they perceive to be um, appropriate. I shouldn't have said that. That's kind of biased, but you, you guys understand. <laughs> Great. Um, well, we've got three minutes left. So if there are any last questions, um, uh, I put my email in the chat again. So if you have, if you want more information on a particular topic or any questions come up after the presentation, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, um, yeah, uh, but, but if there are other questions, now we do have a minute or two to, to address those. So please feel free to, um, to ask. Yeah, so there was a, a comment from Debbie. Um, a key issue with preschoolers is that um, is that child is often not receiving services, but family slash child slash teacher needs support. Talk with director of daycare program providers, et cetera. Yes, communication is always key, um, especially during this time, but all the time. And so you know, there's there's a, a level of command or, you know, a ladder, right? And so you want to make sure that you, you have all the, um, you're taking all of those precautions, being honest, collaborating, being transparent about what are the needs, what are the, you know, fears or concerns or what have you, and then working from there. Absolutely. Putting my email address in the chat. Um, feel free to email me um, if you have any questions with regards to behavior intervention plans or overall IEP services, um, uh, remote IEP meetings or mediations that you all may need support on or just have some questions. Again, our services are free. And we service from birth all the way to the age of 26. And we do have someone in our office that speaks Spanish. I unfortunately just understand it. Great. Um, so again, we are going to share um, the slides and uh, the sample BIP with everyone who registered uh, for the event. So. You should just do that to the email address that you use to register. Um, and uh, you can reach out to either myself or Amanda with any additional questions. Um, but if there are no other questions, um, I think uh, we can uh, wrap up the event. Um, the recording of the event will be available on our Facebook page. Uh, so if you want to go back and you forgot something and you missed something, you want to share this with somebody else, that would be available. Oh, uh, was there a, a, one, a last question from uh, Joanne? No. Okay. No. Oh, yes. Did you want to ask a question? No, thank you. I just wanted her email. I was trying to get it and she gave it. Thank you. Perfect. Amazing. Wait, what, do you want me to say it again? Yes, if you can, it would be helpful. Sure. So it's A H A U G H T at U W S as in Sam O as in Oscar F as in Frank N as in Nancy Y as in Yo Yo 
dot O as in Oscar, R as in Roger, G as in girl. Thank you. You're very <laughs> welcome. Bye-bye. Thank you all for Bye. taking the time, um, taking your time out to spend it with us. I really appreciated the questions and appreciated just being able to share information with you all. Thank you. Amazing. Oh, yeah, sorry, Amanda, you put in uh, A-H-A-U-G-H-T at W at, at uh, U-W-S-O-S-N-Y.com, but it's dot oh, org, sorry. correct? Yeah, dot org. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> it is dot org. All right. Thank you 